Nasifiwe Opakruoth and Karibu uh, to all of you Elam Theological Institute students. We, this is Pastor Brad Abley, and we are in our study on Old Testament Survey Part 1, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for believers today. And we've been going through Genesis. Uh, uh, through, we, we've covered Genesis, Exodus. We're just about done with Leviticus. That's where we're going to get to in just a moment. And then in the next uh, teachings, we'll make it through Numbers and Deuteronomy. Before we get into Leviticus, or before we resume our study in Leviticus, Today it was just on my heart to do a brief devotional with you, of course, from the Old Testament. And that devotional will come from Psalm 138. Zaburi. I don't know what 138 is, but I know what Psalms is. Zaburi. I love that word. And we're in Psalm 138. Let me read uh, verses 1 through 8. David the great man after God's own heart says, I will give you thanks with all my heart. Ero kamano ahinya nyasai. Amen. I will give you thanks with all my heart. With all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. Don't you just know that the demons of hell hate it when God's people sing praises to him. I will give thanks to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your chesed, your loving kindness, and your truth. For, for He says, For you have exalted above all else your name and your word, your name and and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. That was probably David's request was for boldness. And Yahweh answered him, All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, when they have heard the words of your mouth. We have a president right now that, that publicly give, gives thanks to God uh, uh, for when he hears the words of uh, the Lord's mouth. The previous, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, all the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, when they have heard the words of your mouth. And they will sing of the ways of Yahweh, for great is the glory of of Yahweh, for though Yahweh is exalted, he says, uh, he, yet he regards the lowly, uh, the depressed, that is, he cares for the depressed, but the haughty, he knows from afar, that is, he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's, that's probably where Peter uh, wrote 1 Peter chapter 5, and uh, verse 7 and James chapter 4 that's probably where they got this though I walk in the midst of trouble or distress you will revive me you will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me Yahweh will accomplish what concerns me? Your chesed, O Yahweh, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Or I often like to say, you will not forsake the works of your hands. And I pray that, well, actually I forgot to pray before we open up the word. I rarely, almost never forget to first pray before we open up the word. Hopefully someone opened up in prayer first. But I, I pray that you are encouraged by the Word of God, by Psalm 138. Well, let's pray now and ask the Holy Spirit to bless what we've just studied. We pray now, Holy Spirit, be roho maler, njo roho takatifu. Come, Holy Spirit. Without you, 
opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts, we cannot receive what you desire for us to receive. We pray now that you would help us to hear with faith, that you would draw us closer to you, our great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Change us and transform us as we study your word. Help us to disciple others. Give us your heart for the lost. May you be glorified in our teaching. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. O Paki Yesu. Praise the Lord. Well, we, we left off in our last teaching. In uh, we're, we're going through a survey of Leviticus. And um, where did I leave off? We were talking about um, apparent contradictions of David saying uh, sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired and and I explained all that and then I went to 1 Samuel 15 uh, and explained that as well now w one of the reasons why David writes what he writes and why uh, Samuel rebuked Saul um, they uh, th Samuel was one of Yahweh's prophets and whom God used to call Israel into genuine uh, relationship with him, to know him and his ways, and to worship him from a pure heart. In fact, Yahweh raised up other prophets who called Israel to true worship of him. Isaiah 11 uh, and verse 1, Jeremiah uh, chapter 6 and verse 20, um, Jeremiah 7 verses 22 and 23, Amos, uh, chapter 5, verse 22, Micah, uh, chapter 6, and verses 6 through 8, and then Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. But the greatest prophet of all, that is Jesus, showed the spiritual intent of the Torah on many occasions. The reference there is Matthew 5, uh, verses 17 through 48. So Leviticus has shown the need for atoning blood to be shed so that the people could have restored fellowship with Yahweh. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, period. However, human nature is predictable, isn't it? We all go through the motions and, and all believers must, we have to continually remind ourselves and be reminded by the Holy Spirit that God is looking for hearts who love Him. Now on a different note, in Leviticus 11 through 16, chapters 11 uh, through 16, Yahweh gave Israel sanitary laws. Uh, for practical holiness, especially for their bodies, for their protection. And when we disobey sanitary laws, disease is a result. So I know that you have something in your culture that when dead people die, things are done that are, are ungodly and wicked and uh, with the body, the dead body. And and sickness and disease can spread and cause an epidemic and a plague. And yet I understand that some Christians even give themselves to this uh, abominable practice. And there are consequences when we disobey God's, uh, God's laws for our protection. These laws that are in Leviticus 11 through 16 do not, if we keep them, uh, or if we disobey them, it has nothing to do with our salvation, but it's holiness of, of physical lifestyle to protect us from sickness and disease. In Leviticus 17 through 26, we see a concentrated um, emphasis on holiness, focusing on the souls of the people, with details intended to lead the people into a deeper understanding of Yahweh's holiness and to conform to his expressed will 
in holy living. Now, in our section on, on Exodus, you might recall, we said that we would investigate more of the feasts and the appointed seasons and celebrations in Leviticus. We've already discussed the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles in Exodus, or also called the Feast of Booths, uh, but we should mention the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's in Leviticus 23, uh, verses 6 through 7. Let's read that now. Leviticus 23, and verses 6 through 7. The Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23, and um, verses 6 through 7. Is that what I said? Um, yes, 23, 6 through 7. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to Yahweh. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to Yahweh. On the seventh day is a holy convoc convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So no, no hard work on the first day. No hard work on the seventh day. They were to be days of celebration to Yahweh for the benefit of the people and to worship Him as well. But they were to commemorate the hardships of, of hurried flight out of Egypt by preparing beforehand to eat unleavened bread for the week leading up to their exodus. So there's another reason why Yahweh says don't do any laborious work on the first day or on the seventh day. To remind them of, of uh, the Sabbath rest that he, he gave them and to remind them of the liberty uh, that, that they experienced from slavery, working seven days a week. Now, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, took place 50 days after the Passover and after the wheat harvest. That's in Leviticus 23, 15 through 20. But it signified and an offering gratitude to Yahweh for his provision for their daily bread. Isn't it interesting that in Jesus' pattern of prayer, in Matthew 6, 11, he calls us to ask uh, the Father, give us this day our daily bread. That's an opportunity for us, not, not only to ask for, our, our, for food, but it's a reminder to us and, and, a, and an open door for us to make our petitions uh, to Yahweh for whatever it is that is burdening us, whatever it, it is that we need. So you see, what you see here is Yahweh's concern and care for his people. You see it in Leviticus, you see it in Matthew. He is consistent all the way through. The Day of Atonement, we talked about that um, already, Yom Kippur, was the only day of fasting required by the Torah. Remember, the Torah is the teaching or instruction of Yahweh. Uh, uh, it's spelled, um, in English, it would be spelled T-O-R-A-H. And that is the teaching of uh, the, the noun is the teaching or instruction of Yahweh. Um, uh, I believe it, the verb is yara or yare. And that means to teach or to instruct. That's what we're involved in right now, isn't it? So, um, no work was, was permitted on the Day of Atonement. And the main purpose of the sacred day was to make atonement for the nation. I'm repeating myself a little bit from the previous teaching. Now, on that day, only the high priest could officiate, clearly pointing to the work of Jesus 
the great high priest who made atonement for our sins and provided the way for us to worship God freely at all times. We don't have to sacrifice our own animals. Jesus was sacrificed for us. Isn't that just a liberating thought? Now, a major difference between the sinless Messiah and the Jewish high priest is that the Jewish high priest had to offer two rams as burnt offering sacrifices for himself and for the congregation, and a bowl for his own sin offering and two goats for as a sin offering for the people. And the writer of Hebrews points this contrast out dramatically because what he says in Hebrews 7, 23 through 28, in fact, let's turn there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 23 through 28, again, we see the continuity and discontinuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant when we look at Leviticus and Hebrews. Hebrews looks back to so much of the book of Leviticus and explains from a new covenant standpoint the significance of Leviticus. Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 23 through 28. The writer of Hebrews says this, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. I love it. What a contrast between the perfect man, Christ Jesus, who is also God, and human priests who were frail and sinful and temporary. Therefore, verse 25, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Our Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for us right this very minute. Isn't that an incredible thing? Praise the Lord. I lost my place. Uh, so he says, therefore, verse 25, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he, Jesus, always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself and that means the end of animal sacrifices for the law, the Torah, appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever through his sufferings. We talked about that last time. Now, what the reason that the what the writer of Hebrews is doing there is he is appealing to Jewish believers in the Messiah who were being sorely persecuted by their non-Jewish, uh, by their um, non-believing Jewish brethren. And what the Jewish brethren were saying to them is you have forsaken the covenant with Yahweh and they were trying to teach that on some of them were trying to teach that unless you keep the Torah and believe in Jesus, you can't be saved. Or they were trying to teach that the Torah was um, superior to the New Covenant. And that's why the book, the writer of Hebrews, is pointing out the contrast 
between what came before and, and, and what it pointed to and then what came through Jesus Christ. Promise fulfillment. That's the benefit um, or the uniqueness of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We cannot appreciate uh, the fulfillment that we're walking in unless we understand what went before it, what preceded it. Um, in a sense, I don't know if this is the best example or analogy, but um, we have we have a few generations of Americans that, for the most part, don't understand the sacrifice that previous generations made in order to have a nation that is prosperous and free. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of World War I and World War II and the, the sacrifices that, that so many men who lost their lives in battle made for our liberty. Had they not made that sacrifice, all of Europe, and who knows, maybe the whole world would have become Nazis. And so a current generation must learn the lessons of a previous generation. Likewise, we who are in the New Covenant period cannot ignore the importance of the Old Covenant because it makes our faith richer. It makes our faith richer. We can't be ignorant of the Old Testament. Of course, that's why we're studying uh, Old Testament uh, survey. Now finally, after making extensive sacrificial offerings to God, sprinkling blood on the mercy seat, the high priest even sprinkled blood in the prescribed areas of the tabernacle, signifying sin's corrupting influences even in the most sacred place. Just by virtue of a sinner walking into the sacred place, Yahweh wanted to remind even the high priest. All right, well, welcome, Karibu, uh, dear friends, Elam theological students, um, and Opak Ruoth, Opak Yesu, and Buana Asifiwe. This is Pastor Brad Abley, and um, we are in the midst of studying Old Testament survey, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament uh, for believers today. And you can see uh, that I just love the, the Old Testament. And there is so much to be gained through a joyful study of the Old Testament. And I trust the Lord that that's what I'm uh, am, am able by the Holy Spirit to impart uh, to you. So we are almost done now with our our course on Old Testament Survey Part 1, Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. And uh, we've got two more parts to go, of course, and we'll get to that in due time. Before we get into our study, of course, let's pray. Walem. And uh, so would you join me in prayer now? Father, we come to you now through Jesus Christ. And we thank you that through your word we discover that we have wide open access to you, our Heavenly Father, who loves us and cares for us and has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Oh, how we thank you, Holy Spirit, now that you are the one that leads us and guides us into all the truth. And we pray that you would come, Holy Spirit, now. Be Rojo Maler. Come and open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts so that we can hear and receive and become more, more like Jesus and be your blessing to everyone we come into contact with and be those servants of the Lord who will be faithful to you and faithful to your word. Handle, handling it accurately and with your heart to see the unsaved uh, come to faith in you Lord Jesus and to build your church use what we're studying today for your glory all the days of our lives 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, we left off last time. Uh, we we're going through the book of Numbers. And where I left off last time was on the section of prayer. We've seen in or we see in Numbers a number of areas or several areas where Moses is praying. And what I'd like to do now is take you uh, through some of those verses that uh, we find Moses praying to begin with in Numbers chapter 11. Numbers uh, chapter 11. If you'll turn with me to Numbers 11. Now, the, the Israelites had been, as we've learned in Numbers, Numbers covers their approximately 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And we know that if we've read Exodus and Numbers, that the people complained a lot uh, uh, against God and to God and against Moses and so on and so forth. So Moses tells us, now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of Yahweh. And when Yahweh heard it, his anger was kindled. Remember now that the Bible tells us that he is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. So the complaining must have been prolonged and it must have been uh, very intense because it caused the wrath of God to burn. Now, of course, it was prolonged because we've learned that uh, that the nation, the children of Israel were wandering in the desert for 40 years despite all the miracles and all the miraculous provision, the supernatural provision that Yahweh had given to them. So his anger was kindled and the fire of Yahweh burned among them and consumed some of them, some of the outskirts of the camp. So people died because they had murmured and complained against the Lord. The people therefore cried out to Moses and Moses prayed to Yahweh. Moses interceded on their behalf. There's a great example of the heart of a godly leader to stand in the gap and to pray uh, for believers. You see that in the life of the Apostle Paul, who no doubt heeded Moses' example in the way that Paul prayed for the churches that he wrote to. You can see that especially twice in Ephesians and once in Philippians and uh, once in Colossians and several other times in his epistles. The people cried out to Moses and Moses prayed to Yahweh and the fire died out. That is powerful intercession. You know, remember uh, in James, where James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain on the earth for three years. As a matter of fact, let me just, let me turn there to uh, James chapter 5 since we're speaking on the subject of prayer, and isn't it interesting that James uses an Old Testament example, and he uses Elijah as an example. Now, I'm not sure why James chose to use Elijah as an example, but I'm sure glad he did, because James is showing the relevance of the Old Testament. But he does it by way of contrast. Comparing and contrast. So notice with me in uh, James chapter 5 and verse 17. Well, let me go back to verse 16. Therefore, James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective or the fervent prayer of a righteous man uh, accomplishes much. Now, James is going to give an example of Elijah to prove his point. So he says, Elijah, 
was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Well, to bring judgment upon uh, Ahab and Jezebel for their wicked reign over the people of Israel and the people of Israel that were buying into the wickedness of Ahab and Jezebel, who were Ahab was the king of Israel at the time. So Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Now when he says on the earth, most likely what he's referring to is the land. The, the, the Greek word uh, gay uh, can mean earth or land. It probably was the land of Israel. And then in verse 18, James tells us, Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. James is teaching us that we also are men and women with the nature like Elijah. Elijah prayed down the rain from heavens, from the heavens, and it rained. Well, Moses stood in the gap and prayed for the people of Israel, and God answered, We are, he was a man with a nature just like ours. That's what we should be reminded of when we look at Moses' example in prayer. Then in verses 10 through 15, we see another example of Moses praying, and he's basically, in a sense, he's complaining to Yahweh, but not in the same sense as the people were complaining. He was expressing his overwhelming burden in pastoring and in shepherding the people, if you will. And God answered that prayer in verses 16 and following by giving Moses wisdom in raising up 70 men, elders of Israel, who could help him. So then in verse 29, in verse 29, uh, these 70 men, are prof they prophesied, and uh, then two other men who weren't with them also prophesied because the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Uh, one's name was Eldad, and the other one's name was Medad. And a young man, verse 27, ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? So Joshua made it about Moses. And Moses makes it about God. Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all, that all Yahweh's people were prophets and that Yahweh would put his spirit on them. What a powerful prayer that was answered. Later on, it was Joel who said, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Of course, it hadn't happened yet. Ah, but it did happen on the day of Pentecost. And we read about that in Acts chapter 2, uh, two verses 17 and 18, when Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. You see the connection of what's happening in the, under the new covenant with what happened in the old covenant. And so ever since then, now that prophecy and the prayer of Moses has been fulfilled and continues to be filled, or fulfilled. Praise God. We see the example of Moses, the man of prayer, in the book of Numbers, and that's one of the reasons why Numbers is also important.
Amen? There are other areas that he prays as well, but I think I've given you um, a few good examples. Let's, um, let's, let us, let me see if I want to take another look at, or if I want to look at a few more. Let's see if, let me look at um, Hebrews, uh, no, not Hebrews, Numbers. Oh, yeah. The, the murmuring of Miriam and Aaron in Numbers chapter 12. Now, who was Miriam? Miriam was Moses' sister, Aaron's sister as well. They, there's Moses and, and Aaron were brothers, and Miriam was uh, their sister. And notice in Numbers 12, verse 1, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And this Cush, Cushite woman was African. I love it. She was African. And, uh, and so they... They were, they were frustrated that Moses married this woman, maybe because she wasn't an Israelite. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? So they're tearing down Moses' authority and his leadership and attacking his character for no good reason. And then we find in verse 3 an addition, not by Moses, most likely by Joshua later. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Right there, my friends, this verse in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 is certainly one of the more important verses in Scripture. Why? Because, think about it with me, Moses moved in more power. You know, all of us are, are too easily impressed with power, aren't we? And some of us are guilty of lusting after power, even if it's the miraculous power of God. Oftentimes it's because we want to be lifted up. And we want to become famous. We want to build a following. And we want to be like the other ministers that do miracles. Now don't get me wrong. I believe in the miraculous. And I move in the miraculous. But to God be the glory. But the thing that we need to learn from Moses, don't we? Is this. Here was a man who moved in power and influence maybe like no man on the planet ever moved in. If you think about the amount of people that followed him, several million people, God used Moses to deliver the Israelites out of slavery that they had been in for 430 years, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God did the Ten Plagues through Moses. God parted the Red Sea through Moses. If anyone should have been proud and lifted up and arrogant... Surely it would have been Moses. Look what I've done. And yet, the great example that we learn <laughs> from Moses is that others looked at him and said, that man is more humble than any man on the planet. If Moses, my friends, could walk in that level of humility, should that not also be a stirring example for us to walk 
likewise in humility? Well, what about Jesus, who is greater than Moses? Come to me, he said. All you are, who are weary and heavy laden, and, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. The Greek word is proutes, which is refers to someone who is extremely humble. For I am gentle and humble of heart. That Greek word uh, translated hu this humble is, means to behave in an unassuming manner, devoid of all haughtiness. So when you, you know, when, when Jesus walked, he did not, he did not, boast himself and say, look at me. He was just very ordinary. He was not a showman. He was not a showman like the Pharisees. And yet, why is it that so many ministers today are proud and lifted up and, and, and showy and flashy and domineering and expect people to wait on them and serve them when Jesus knelt down and washed Peter's feet which form of leadership should we be following man's form of leadership or Jesus form of leadership Moses form of leadership or the kind of leadership that we often see today men that that climb the religious ladder and have flashy clothes and expensive cars. Is that what the Christian faith is all about? No, my friends, that is a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a perversion. And I will say it is a stench in the nostrils of God that we would use the gospel to get rich for ourselves is pathetic. It is. Show me one example, one example in the entire Bible of a man of God who used his authority and his influence for personal gain. Did Peter do it? No. Did Paul do it? No. Did Jesus do it? No. Did Timothy do it? No. Did Moses do it? No. Did Joshua do it? No. Did Abraham do it? No. Yes, Abraham was very wealthy. But he didn't use his godliness to take advantage of godliness for personal wealth. Yes, Job was a very, very wealthy man. But yet Job could say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, enough of that right there. I think I've made my point quite clear. And I hope that we have something very careful to think about. So then in verse 4, suddenly Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out of the tent of meeting. So the three came out. Verse 5, Then Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam. And when they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses, who is faithful in all my household, which the writer of Hebrews quotes in Hebrews 3, verses 5 and 6, to point the readers of Hebrews to Jesus, who, 
because he says Moses was a servant in God's house and Jesus is a servant over God's house. Check out those verses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, a figure of speech for intimacy, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of Yahweh burned against them, and he departed. Verse 10, But when the cloud had withdrawn over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. Now, Miriam, from the, her, her skin was dark. She's from the Middle East. Brown, probably. Brown skin. So this was astonishing. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. And then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. And Moses cried out to Yahweh saying, Oh, God, heal her, I pray. Look at the mercy that Moses moved in. Look at the humility that Moses moved in. Many ministers would say, good, you got what you deserve. That's what you get for speaking against me. That's what you get for trying to undermine authority, my authority. That's what you get for rebelling against me. You deserve everything you got. Many ministers would do that, and they do do that. But Moses cries out to God on her behalf, and once again, God listens. Maybe not the way Moses had hoped. Verse 14, But Yahweh said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, she would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam, verse 15, was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Excuse me. I think that we should stop and pray right now. I read this passage earlier about the people complaining. And it caused me to ask God to forgive me for all the hundreds and hundreds of times I've complained. Probably thousands of times that I've complained against the Lord. Or against some of his servants or against other believers or over my circumstances. Now by His grace, I have always clung to the gift of repentance. And so when the Holy Spirit convicts me of something that I've done wrong, of sin, then I'm very quick to repent, very quick to repent. And, and I can't brag about that, but I fear the Lord enough to repent immediately. And I pray that you have that attitude as well, loved ones. That you live a lifestyle of confession of sin and repentance. Before we go further, let's allow the Holy Spirit, who is already convicting probably all of you, 
to then allow him to lead us in confession and repentance of our sin. So join me now. Our Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, we have sinned against you repeatedly by murmuring and complaining. And we ask you now to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us, Father, for our murmuring and complaining against you. Father, forgive us for murmuring and complaining against others. We repent of our sin. And we turn away from it to walk with you in humility. Blessing instead of cursing. Forgiving instead of judging. Cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And Father, we receive your forgiveness now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. It's almost hard to move on it feels like a like a holy moment here and I prayed that the Holy Spirit would move powerfully in in our time I had no idea that this was going to happen I didn't plan it at all at all so we thank God that he hears prayer well, I could go on and give other examples. You've got those examples in your notes. Let's move on and, and just note that Mo Numbers was written to two groups of people. First, the disobedient older generation, which saw Yahweh's miraculous power in delivering them from Egypt. And then it was written to the younger generation, 20 years and younger, which grew up in the wilderness and would enter the promised land. So this is a generation that had never lived in Egypt. But it was the younger generation that was to learn from and not repeat the sins of their fathers. And thus Yahweh punished the faithless generation which rejected his repeated offers of grace and his power and his provision. They rejected the grace of God the power of God, the provision of God. So he punished the faithless generation, which rejected his grace, his power and provision to allow a defiant, unbelieving, perverted generation to enter his promised land would have been an utter disaster. If God had, had allowed them to enter his promised land, it would have been a disaster because they would have poisoned his holy land from the beginning. God is giving the land to them, and they must walk in and enter that land in obedience, because how we begin things is so important. However, in his grace, he was at the same time preparing a faithful generation to inherit the land and that they did but they had to do it the right way no wonder at the beginning of the church when revival was taking place and souls were getting saved left and right and people were getting filled with the Holy Spirit Ananias and Sapphira lost their lives because how how we begin 
matters for how we continue. And there are certain times that God is on the move that he won't forgive what he may, may forgive in the past. You see, we can't predict how God is going to move in our lives or others' lives. But we can only be responsible for our own lives. That's why the importance of the fear of the Lord. We can never get enough of the fear of of the Lord, which David talks about in Psalm 34. If you'll turn with me to Psalm 34, this isn't in in the notes, but I often use Psalm 34 to ask Yahweh to give me a greater sense of reverence for Him. Psalm 34, verse 8, O oh, taste... There's no verse like this in the New Testament. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. I was just singing about the goodness of Yahweh earlier this morning. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man or the woman who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, you his holy ones. You see, even in the Old Testament, God's people were called holy ones. In the New Testament, we're called saints in Christ Jesus. Oh, fear Yahweh, you his saints. For to those who fear him, there is no want, no lack. Why? Because we're content. We're satisfied in Him. Therefore, we're not coveting what we don't have. We're not lusting out after what we don't have. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek Yahweh shall not be in want of any good thing. I can testify to that in my own life in the more than 30 years that I've been a believer. Now listen to this in verses 11 through 14. Come, you children, listen to me. Now David is teaching. Who is the man who desires life? Chaim, the life of God, and loves length of days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil. We just read about that in Numbers. Was David conscious of the example that we read about in Numbers when he wrote this? He, I think he probably was. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace Shalom and pursue it. Remember that word shalom that is translated peace means it refers to well-being, wholeness, soundness, absence of strife. It's the state of fulfillment which is the result of God's presence. It's the state of fulfillment which is the result of the presence of Yahweh? Let us fear the Lord. Amen. Gleason Archer explains the reason for the numbering of the people in the two census takings. Numbers 1 through 4 and then Numbers 26. They were to show that the people were not kept out of Canaan by their insufficient numbers. He writes, let me read that again. They were to show, the census takings were to show that the people were not kept out of Canaan by their insufficient numbers. And he writes, 
It was not the size of their army that mattered, but only the size of their faith that mattered. It is indeed a complex story, Numbers is, of unfaithfulness and rebellion and apostasy and frustration set against the background of God's faithfulness and forbearance, his patience. He is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, but we should never, ever, ever, if we're moving in the fear of the Lord, try and take advantage of the fact that he's slow to anger. Amen? Woo! Wow. Jesus in Numbers. Perhaps no place is there a clearer portrait of Jesus and his crucifixion than in the serpent being lifted up on the standard in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9, and then, of course, Jesus refers to that in John 3, verse 14, by way of uh, type or even anti-type, opposite, by way of contrast. I, I almost wish I would take some time to go into that and explain it. It's not real easy to understand, and I've done some research on it in the past, uh, but I... Actually, I don't feel led to do that now. The, the second way that Jesus appears in the book of Numbers is that he is the rock that quenched the thirst of the people. That, that act was a prophetic act of Jesus. He is the one who is the water of life. You can see how Paul refers back to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 4. Then the daily manna pictures Jesus as the bread which came down from heaven. He, he teaches about that all in John chapter 6. And he's referring back to numbers. And he is the one that say, says that he was the bread that, that gave them their spiritual life. And of course, he along with the Father and the Holy Spirit provided the manna, the, the physical manna for them as well. And then Balaam foresaw the star which was to come out of Jacob. And that was a messianic prophecy, Numbers 24, verse 17. Norman Geisler observes that while Leviticus is a book of worship, Numbers focuses on the people's walk with Yahweh. Leviticus is worship, Numbers is walk. Leviticus stresses their purity. The Leviticus, the book of Leviticus stressed the need for purity for the people in their relationship with Yahweh. Numbers stresses their pilgrimage, their pilgrimage out of the, the, the Egyptian wilderness or in and into the promised land. Leviticus is ceremonial. Numbers is historical. Le Leviticus gives the call to fellowship with God. Numbers is a call to faithfulness with him. And so we've looked at the book of Numbers and and uh, I've given you in the notes an outline of numbers as well. So next we are going to go into Deuteronomy. And then we will be finished with our first part of um, Old Testament survey, part one. It's been a joy to go through this with you. And um, <clears throat> I pray that the Lord will use what we've been studying to more deeply root you and ground you in the faith of God, to give you a greater love for the Old Testament, to help you to teach 
from the Old Testament and show its unity with the New Testament? And to disciple people in a love for the Word of God. Let me close in prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.